All right, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today uh, for another OpenShift Coffee Break uh, episode. So today we will have a great conversation with my dear friend, Tero. Um, uh, he's uh, been our co-host for quite some time now, and uh, he's our, uh, I would say, uh, guest for, for as long as he, he wishes. And today we will speak about uh, all things DevOps. So that's, uh, that's quite a lot to, to handle, uh, Tero. But I hope uh, we're going to have a nice conversation uh, today. So um, yeah, Tero, can you please uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, I have a proper answer. Thanks for inviting me, inviting me here. As oh, I've yeah, been as a, a permanent uh, guest and a permanent uh, host. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, I worked uh, for Red Hat when I when this uh, coffee opposite coffee break was started, and then I moved to Vangel where I do DevOps now. Uh, so, I let's say I bring an outside view to the to, uh, to support these guys who have all Red Hat eyeglasses, so they they see everything from the Red Hat and opposite point of view. I I uh, I bring some sanity into their thoughts and how things look outside. Yeah, and it's I always good. I think it's 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 a sane and it's refreshing to have uh, an outside view because one once you live in your own world, you, you you know things happen outside and you need to be aware of what happens outside too. Yeah. All right. And so, why we are uh, in this situation, Natalie is enjoying his uh, wonderful vacation, probably in South Italy. Uh, so nice. warm weather uh, goes swimming. So, and we don't have uh, contacts like he has. So we just didn't have any guests to invite. So we are doing yeah. this well, uh, like this. We, we we have we have more than enough with you. I I, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So uh, and so if you are. Uh, waiting for slides or demos, there will be none. It will be discussion only. So yeah, if that's and boring. If anyone uh, on the chat wants to ask questions, as a, as always, please go ahead and ask whatever uh, questions you have regarding the topic or even off topic, if you want. If you want to know how Tero has a, always this uh, nice haircut, you can ask him what he <laughs> what he it, uses. I it's a barber a... as a service. It's a barber <laughs> as a service. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Subscription based. Nice. <laughs> All right. So for, for those who are just joining for the first time, my name is uh, Jafar Shraibi, and I work as a tech marketing manager for uh, OpenShift. Uh, prior to that, I've been an OpenShift consultant for for about five years, and um, I'm very happy to, you know, to help people adopt uh, container technologies and get better with uh, with OpenShift. So, um, okay, so uh, Tiro, our main uh, topic today is uh, DevOps, right? It's so, a good topic uh, since you can talk yeah. whatever you want and hashtag yeah. DevOps. So exactly, yeah. I, I feel like it's a, it's, a, it's a big container where you can put anything you want. It can mean a lot of things to to different people, so let's let's try to first uh, set the ground and, and you know get a, a better understanding of what lies behind DevOps. So, can you tell us about you know your your perception of what DevOps is? What is it? Why did people start uh, adopting it? What are the goals, uh, etc.? Yeah, it's a. Uh... This is a nice question. The answer is always different because it varies. Uh, and the short answer is DevOps is a culture. It's a culture of way of doing things uh, like DevOps way. So whatever you do uh, in your organization that helps you to like be more efficient, better quality, uh, whatever there is between a, a feature and go in production and then run in production. Everything that you do there between can be called as DevOps. And okay. when you like, not let, let's say not 
you can call everything DevOps. If you call way back, we have these old waterfall projects. It was not DevOps, but still those old projects, old enterprises can use DevOps tooling to like increase the, um, how would I say, they increase the DevOps culture in, in the organization so that they can have small parts of the development process automated or use some specific tooling, automated building, testing, whatever. So mm -hmm. DevOps is basically whatever happens and you define your DevOps. There is no, like Siamak said it when we have a last, we had a KidOps and DevOps mm -hmm. uh, episode that DevOps is a culture and GitOps is a way to like implement that culture. Implement. So GitOps is a tool, DevOps is a culture. Okay. And some somebody uh, said to me, uh, actually just before I read, uh, left Red Hat that he asked me that what is the most important tool for developer in a DevOps culture? And the, uh, and the answer is pretty pretty simple and really old tool. It's Git. <laughs> so the, the, you might think about it's, uh, it's Kubernetes, it's containers, it's your development IDE. But actually, if you think about it, it's version control system. Probably it's Git. It, there's no SVN or CVS anymore. But, but that, that's the like lengthy answer about what okay. is DevOps. You define what is your DevOps. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, let's. Uh, so thanks. Uh, first, I, I, I would say we are trying, you know, to 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 set the set the ground. So uh, even even people that don't have uh, 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 much of an understanding of of that topic can maybe you know catch up. So uh, of course we we see that the the word topics is a contraction of uh, the word DevOps is a contraction of two words. So we see Dev and Ops. Uh, again, just you know, for the the main viewers who are just you know uh, kicking tires here. So why why do we call it DevOps? Like, what's the 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 main thing that we are trying to accomplish with this that maybe was not that successful prior to this um, culture change? So yeah, uh, why why do we call it DevOps? Like, obviously, Dev seems for developers, Ops for operations, uh, and can you yeah just explain in few words what we are trying to achieve? I lost audio, so oh, this is now back. Okay. okay, but okay, uh, okay. yeah, I heard. But okay. you all have seen the, the comic that there is a dev that uh, throws a binary over the world to ops. Yeah. And that's basically, that's not DevOps. And that's the, that's the old way of doing that. Developers create a binary and yeah. then they deploy it. So they send it somewhere and then operators do whatever they like to get it running, to maintain it. Uh, and if there is a bug, there is an probably a Jira ticket or something that, hey, there is a bug, can you fix it? And then developers ask, uh, can you send me some log files so that I, I know what is the error message? So this is the old fashioned way of doing that. There is no visibility whatsoever between the development process and the operations and running. And everything was insanely slow. I, I remember working with a customer way before Red Hat that you always had to create a ticket to get the logs from production. And that might take days. Yeah. So how can you be like agile and fast and fix issues if you don't know what is the problem and then you have to wait for the actually know the problem. There might be in the logs null pointer exception. And then you see only that and then, okay, where is it uh, yeah. when it happens? And, and so not, not only that, but you also have to reproduce it like in an environment that that's going to be similar to what they have like in production. So, and also just that can take days if it's not, you know, automated and already, yeah. I would say in a DevOps mindset. 
and how many organizations have <laughs> like copy of the production with production data and production load. So it yeah. might happen that when you have 10,000 requests per second, this single bug happens. So you cannot simulate it. And what we can say that what we just described, that is not DevOps. So it's, mm -hmm. it's very easy to say what is DevOps, but then it's harder to say what actually uh, is DevOps because it, it varies. But how we actually ended up to have this topic that all things DevOps is that it actually comes from my background that uh, at Red Hat, let's say, from June this year, five years back, I worked in pre-sales, uh, which was everything related to uh, containers, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes application development. Since I've been doing on development, I've been a developer for 20, more than 20 years. So mm -hmm. the development part of the pre-sales uh, support was really close to my heart. And the DevOps, let's say five years ago, DevOps was an was a term and there were really good uh, companies that tried to uh, boost the term. There's a company in Finland that arranges DevOps days and there were DevOps days globally to introduce the concept of DevOps to the, uh, to the uh, audience. But no one really understood what the DevOps was then. Uh, and there was these unicorn companies that uh, did DevOps. And the problem was that there was not enough tooling. Just because even the DevOps is a culture, you need mm -hmm. those that tooling to implement that culture to do, or you have to implement those tools yourself. Uh, and when the DevOps got going, uh, and when I work in the pre-sales and try to sell the idea in double code, sell the idea of how you can like transform your organization to be more agile uh, using DevOps, content native, cloud native, all these passwords. During that time, I was, let's say, I got pretty good at selling the idea, but that was really opinionated view of only one part of the DevOps. So how get code easily and securely running. That's yeah. it. Because in pre-sales, we don't see what happens once the code is running. Yeah. That is, yeah. yeah, that is DevOps, yes, but only tiny part of it. Yes, exactly. So yeah, and I, I totally agree with, the, with, with you. And uh, I've, I've been sharing the same experience where Mostly, you know, when we were speaking about DevOps, it's basically how do you get your code as fast and secure as possible from dev to prod. And most of the focus was on like CI/CD. It was yeah. like th there was a, a confusion between CI/CD and DevOps. Whereas, of course, DevOps is much bigger than that. Automation is a, a big pillar of DevOps for sure. Uh, and automation can touch uh, many areas. It can touch like testing, as you said, it can touch provisioning of uh, infrastructure. It can touch deployment of uh, your applications. So automation can be uh, at the heart, is at the heart of DevOps, of course, because you are trying to avoid all those manual tasks uh, as uh, much as possible to have repeatable uh, processes. But yes, I agree that DevOps is not just like, okay, let me commit my, my change. And then, oh, there's a container running with the new version uh, in, in, in production. That's, uh, that's a, I would say, a very simplistic way. But it, it helps basically, as you said, sell the ID. Uh, when I'm saying sell, not in, in the meaning of like really contracting with the, the customer. Of course, that's, that's an end goal at some point, but like to have, in, to have the conversation with the, with the customers about how they are doing things, uh, how they are pushing code into the different environments, how they are provisioning the environments, how they are testing the applications, how they are getting feedback from production, 
uh, when they want to you know improve uh, maybe the performance of their applications fix bugs as you said get logs they don't necessarily you know want to wait three days before they get the logs and stuff like that so yeah, yeah all of those things you see that we are starting to go into different I would say subsets of what DevOps is. And, and so, you have uh, to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. And like having automated uh, CI, CD or building your containers uh, automatically and deploying it, that's a good start. Because uh, you mentioned how important automation is that some say that you cannot do DevOps without automation. And it's, I, kind of, I kind of agree because the the... You uh, because the DevOps way is to in the, the cultural have it's kind of you use DevOps uh, as a culture and tooling behind that to make your organization better in software development. And okay. you have certain limits that you can reach with manual tasks. You you just cannot be a like efficient enough to match the like the cloud native and Kubernetes and container native stuff and the pace if you don't do automation. So it helps a lot. And now it if you like want to put your code to the container and Kubernetes, that is insanely easy nowadays. There is a yeah. You can build containers on Git, uh, in uh, GitLab, in GitHub, in a Bitbucket. You can build them locally. You can deploy them with Maven. There is a zillion tools to deploy those containers. And for developer, that is awesome because the develop usually the developers' task end when mm-hmm. they do a commit and it's merged and it's built and deployed. Feature done, next feature. But then it comes to the what I actually, once I had done the five years of pre-sales, uh, when I moved from pre-sales, for, let's say I moved to the, the bungle and now doing a, a senior staff engineer in, in DevOps at the bungle. And I basically moved to another side of the dev table. Mm-hmm. So from sales to the engineering, my role is help engineering, help assembly teams to uh, do their job better. Uh, and what you see then is that there is a lot of other stuff in DevOps than just shipping your code. Your code. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then what developer, like we touch this like observability points that one important task is to developer should know what's happening uh, in the production, like if there is a yeah. bug that the happening in production, it's a mm-hmm. the dev- developer should have access to the logs and see the production logs so mm-hmm. that they are masked that there is no like uh, secret information in there uh, just because the customer data. But there shouldn't be an process to get the log, logs it should be just a tool that i can read the logs so that this uh you said that this is like you said that devops term comes from development operations this is something that developers do something related to operations they actually mm-hmm. check the production logs and that was earlier the operation people logs you created the ticket you got the logs you read the logs did some testing and so on and so forth but now developers go check the logs and then they, okay, I know where the bug is. I fix it. Uh, good uh, bug fixed. And you all have seen the like DevOps having this uh, number eight sideways, infinite number. There is a big arrow uh, coming back from the developer loop, the operations loop. There is a feedback, yeah, continuous what, feedback. The, the continuous feedback. Yeah. yeah so. And I think that that is the last part of the organizations in DevOps they implement properly. Mm -hmm. Because you can do like a lot of automation. You can have a really fast pace when you uh, features. But 
if you don't have a like feedback loop, do you know that these uh, like these uh, DevOps tooling that you use that they actually move to a correct move you to a correct direction? Mm -hmm. You might be releasing really often, but every second release has to be rolled back because of a bug. Yeah. So let's say that uh, you released once per week earlier, and then you had a tooling, you released twice per day, uh, twice per week, but every second release you have to roll back because there's a bug. So basically yeah. you are not any effective. You still have a yeah. complete uh, like successful release once per week. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that so that that means that so yeah, I let, let's let's pause uh, for a second and uh, uh, try to make that uh, more I would say visual. So I I love music, so I, I'm I'm gonna try to have uh, uh, a visual image that depicts what you are talking about. So imagine that you are like you know playing at a huge concert. And you, you're playing guitar, but you don't have the feedback. Like you, you don't know what you are playing. So everybody's doing their thing. You are strumming or playing your solos, but you don't hear what you are doing. So basically you can get pretty, pretty lost because although you feel like you are doing your thing, you don't know if it fits well with the other guys. You don't know if the, the audience is hearing anything because you basically don't have the feedback. You don't hear what you are doing. And, you know, when you are playing concerts, you have those feedback uh, amps, basically, that yeah. give you monitoring, monitoring uh, what you, the other guys are doing and also what you are doing. So, yeah, I'd say that that feedback from production is basically the same thing. Is okay, we've, we've done some stuff. We've deployed the application uh, faster, maybe, but is it better? Is it working? Uh, is it improving? Uh, do we have less bugs, etc., uh, etc.? Et uh, so that's that's the like the the importance of that uh, continuous feedback loop. But now the, it takes it takes us to to uh, another correlated question, which is: so what do we basically track? So how do we? Okay, we have a continuous feedback, but of what? Like what should be in there? Uh, what do we need to to monitor to to have the the correct information to basically be able to diagnose the application, troubleshoot, and compare uh, and know if we have improved performance and stuff like that. So, do you have any hints like what types of metrics, any KPIs? Um, <laughs> That, that's a really good question. And usually the answer is you get what you measure. And yeah, yeah. So you, the, the problem usually is that uh, in organizations, you have uh, persons and teams, have goals, <coughs> and those goals have been linked to and APIs. Let's say you have to do 10 deployments this quarter, that's your goal. So the, the idea is that the team will do the 10 deployments. And, okay, fine, 10 deployments, check, we got our target, we got our bonus. That is what I mean when you get what you measure. But then if eight of those 10 deployments were all packed, you actually did two deployments. Yeah. So that and is you really... you have overhead, and you even yeah. have overhead compared to what yeah. you did before. Yeah, so you should be doing 18 uh, deployments in the, in the next quarter. And mm -hmm. then that, that is actually the hardest part of measurement, the uh, velocity of the DevOps team. So like there is pace and quality, mm -hmm. and the quality can be uh, bugs, security, less costs. So the, it's kind of the, the pace is easy. X amount mm -hmm. of deployments per, but then you have to kind of, because you have to match the quality of the base. So is four deployments better than two successful deployments with good quality? So that if you have a deployment that uh, uh, like raises five new bucks, it must be like 
not that good deployment and deployment that doesn't raise any bugs and actually adds new features. So this is really hard to measure, but you have to yeah. kind of, you have to, everything needs to be like started in the metrics from the business. What yeah. brings money but, to them? Yeah. But let's pause on that bit because it's very uh, interesting and it shows how tricky it can be. So yeah, we're saying, okay, is it better to have four deployments that raise no bugs than one that raises five bugs, for instance? But uh, what if like, because you have released uh, earlier that one deployment, it gave you or your users enough time to, you know, to go through some new features and then you get bugs and then you are able to fix those bugs. So then it, it, it gets better than the four deployments where you didn't catch the bugs. So, uh, you know, it can be tricky, as you said, to, to say, oh, this is like the, uh, the, the KPI and it's going to, to fix all our problems because it's basically always relative, re relative to, to something. There are uh, quantitative KPIs yeah. and qualitative uh, KPIs. Uh, so yeah, it's it's always hard to like define those sets of 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 uh, key uh, metrics. Yeah, and and I think that the, like it is for organization that ha hasn't like doesn't have an, uh, a long DevOps history. They don't know the KPIs. They don't know the velocity. They don't know how many deployments they do. So it's very hard to actually do these uh, measurements, but. One, one easy measurement for development teams is that DevOps teams is that how many deployments and how many rollbacks. Mm -hmm. So if you do a rollback, that wasn't a good deployment. So, so if you are maintained to successful deployments, that's a good and easy KPI. <clears throat> and, but then it's a good point to start because then uh, we can add the the quality in there that how many new features were in this uh, in this uh, deployment, and then you can have a, how many deployments and how what's the lead time for new feature. So yeah. that's also one that how because that usually there's if you have a multiple deployments, you have a ton of deployments. You probably if you have a good quality, you probably add a lot of new features. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you like have a bad quality, you have a lot of deployments, but not much new features because you have fixing bugs and hot fixes and everything. So it's kind of a balance that good deployment, successful deployments, and how what's your feature throughput? Yeah, can, can you pause there for one second again? Yeah, sorry if, if I'm interrupting. No, I yeah, so no, fine. Try, try to keep your IDs, you know, uh, fixed so you can go back to them afterwards, but. Uh, this reminds me of um, a conversation that we had with uh, one of my former customers. It was a very big uh, e-commerce shop, so one of the biggest uh, e-commerce shops in, in France. And we, we were working on their DevOps uh, transformation, uh, basically. And one of the, the key uh, topics that we wanted to address at some point, so everything was automated. Uh, infrastructure provisioning was automated. Application deployment was automated. Uh, so basically, they were doing many, many uh, deployments per week. Uh, so uh, one of the, 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 the topics that we, at some point, we wanted to address was basically what you said, like the lead time to have a feature released into production. But it's, it's not easy to have that because you need to have, we spoke about tooling and, you know, what you need to have across the, 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 the whole DevOps chain. And what usually lacks is like traceability. So you start with the business, um, with a business requirement, and then that business requirement turns into a desired feature in your application. And then this feature is implemented in some sprint. It gets tested, it gets rolled uh, into a release, then it gets deployed. And it's actually, you know, as you move to the different steps, you are going through maybe 10 different tools. 
you know, somewhere where you capture the business requirement. It can be a spreadsheet. It can be a tool like Jira or, you know, this type of more agile uh, ways where you define your user stories, etc. And the question was, how do you keep track? Like, how do you know what feature has been deployed in what binary, actually? Or if we speak about containers, what container images, like what tags, what releases, implement what feature? So we had to think about, you know, all the links that you need to get from the business requirement to the user stories, to the features, uh, to the code, like to the commit, to the commits, to the test sets that go with it, to the release tags that implement that specific feature. So you can have the whole trace, uh, you know, all the way up from development into production. And then you can say, okay, so now for this release, we have implemented these five releases. Uh, we have implemented these five features, okay? So um, yeah, it was not easy to, to set up all that, you know, traceability along the, the chain because you need to have the proper uh, approach, like the, 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 the right people need to, to speak together to, to understand that you, as a developer, you are working on this specific business capability, et cetera. Uh, but you need to have the tooling then to stitch together all the pieces uh, and, and be able to report on, on these, these type of information. So you can then have your, your metrics, like you said, we have implemented these five features, et cetera. But the next question is, okay, so we have implemented five features, okay. But is it better to implement five features that do this? Or is it better to implement this feature, one feature that does this in terms of business value? So again, you have to introduce some new uh, KPIs uh, towards like what value does what each feature bring uh, to your application in terms of whatever you want. It can be in terms of money, it can be in terms of uh, quality perception from your customers. It can be, yeah, you know, customer satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, and, and then your KPIs start to, to be linked together. And then you can say, okay, we have delivered that value because, because you have the whole chain yeah. to, to go back. And that, that's the, like the, if I had a magic wand and unicorns, I would, that's like the, the best solution that you have a business feature that provide that brings money to the, uh, the, the into the house, and then you have features, and you know that I implemented this feature, and that increased our revenue uh, five kilos, yeah. so that mm -hmm. you have exact money. And actually, what we uh, in the mobile games, uh, uh, game refinery is uh, one part of Bungle, and. In there, we provide analytics that because we know what the market is in mobile games. So what feeds, what games are good, how much money they are making uh, per day, per market. So mm -hmm. we can actually tell the to our customers that if you implement it, this feature, it will bring you X amount of mm -hmm. revenue. Yeah, so that's, that's like, because that's, that's then easy. And because then if you have a development team, and of course, development team has X amount of velocity, let's say that they can do three, uh, three features in a quarter. Mm -hmm. So then if you have 10 features in the backlog, it's easy to check that we take those three because those bring the 80% of, uh, of the revenue from all those 10, 10 features. So it's really easy to then prioritize what we do mm -hmm. because those features bring money and that's like in the software development it's really hard to map that since one business feature might split to five different development teams to 10 different microservices and exactly. 100 different commits yeah. and then how do you map that like exactly. the feature can be implemented on 
uh, Twitter authentication. On an epic. <laughs> yeah, uh, impl- or implement Twitter authentication, which is very, very simple. You implement authentication and you start seeing uh, users coming from Twitter. It's mm-hmm. easy to map, but implement something XYZ uh, which has like data team needs to do something. And then so it's insanely hard. Yeah. So it is kind of, I don't know many, uh, many organizations that can do this fine-tuned KPI for development teams that they can actually see that how much each implemented feature brings money to the, uh, yeah. to the business. But that is the end goal. That's where, exactly. because that's, that's good. ideal target. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because also they, uh, there's if you have a bug that users cannot log in, we know that how much the company is losing money. That's really easy to like measure <laughs> yeah. uh, because there are metrics uh, from the history shows that, okay, we lose 100,000 per day. So we should fix it pretty fast. So there's at the end of the day, it's always money. But yeah. if you start your DevOps uh, like road, trying to map business feature and uh, money to development teams, you will never get there. It, it's just too hard. So speaking about features that, uh, you know, you can map to direct value or, or money, just a funny example, but this morning, my wife was doing some online, you know, uh, grocery shopping. And after like 45 minutes of doing her e-commerce stuff, she checked out, but everything was lost and we, she couldn't like go to the, the order. Uh, and she basically, you know, has to go back to, okay, uh, it doesn't work. All these, you know, e-commerce stuff. Let, let's go back to real life. And then, <laughs> so that's, you know, that's a pure uh, loss. And you yeah. can you can easily say that the shopping cart that clears itself is <laughs> directly impacting your, yeah. your money, your, your revenue. Plus so, you waste the customer's time. Yeah, it's pr- yeah, exactly. which is priceless. Yeah. Ex- exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> that happened to uh, yeah. me also. I know. You know those types of, of features. You need to make sure that they work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's true. But we we actually now that we uh, went to the KPIs and how you define uh, actually that this was a, a spin off like. You asked about KPIs, but we got off the track. But uh, the most important KPIs for the application is revenue. How much, mm-hmm. of course, the re- revenue and money can be in different companies. It can be a different kind of, it can be, it might not be concrete money, but it might be services yeah. or some, so on and so forth. Do, 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 you, do you agree if we, instead of, uh, money, we say like value, like if yep. you identify value yep. as a generic, um, you know, everything. Yeah, something that we want to get that yeah. basically drives value and how you define that value basically depends on, on, on each context. Yeah. But yes, so exactly. That always has to be the whole organization and let's say SRE team, DevOps team, development teams, that needs to be the driving force. Uh, because if you try to uh, have something different than actual value, uh, then you are basically fooling yourself. If you have a, like how many requests per second my services can, can take, it, it might be that, okay, we are taking a lot of requests, but those actual requests are coming from a monitoring agent. They are not actually real users. So there has to be like a so simple automated. automated way of collecting the information and see that if you don't have like, if you are a web shop, like the grocery store, you know how much your uh, sell is. How, you know how much you sell. That's a concrete yeah. value. It's easy to measure. Uh, exactly. But then... If you don't have that concrete value, you have to somewhere from other metrics, you have to campaign, the, uh, like collect the enough metrics to know that 
with this amount of requests, with this amount of unit users, we are generally in average creating this amount of value. And if then you know that if we do, uh, do 10,000 unique users uh, per hour, we know that each user pro, uh, like brings value uh, 10x. So if yeah. we then lose, like suddenly our services run only 500, uh, 50,000 uh, requests per second, we know that we are losing half of the value based on the yeah. metrics that we have. So those kind of, this is more like uh, to SRE teams that should work close with, uh, at Wangle, the SRE teams work really close with DevOps that the each service should have an KPI or a service level SLA so that the teams know when the service is working and when it's not working. And then, because if you don't have this visibility, you just don't know why you're doing the correct things. And then mm -hmm. it goes back to the uh, the development teams. So if you don't know know how the services should perform, you never know are your changes going to uh, correct direction. So if you make a change that decreases the throughput, you can mm -hmm. then calculate that okay, this change actually we're losing money. It, yeah. Right. That's a simple, simple calculation. It's not always that simple. And also the, the like this kind of dashboarding, monitoring alerts is, now that I have learned it, I think that it's the most important thing in DevOps, the observability. So that mm -hmm. you have a feedback. In Scrum, it was very well defined, the feedback loop what happens so you get feedback what you're doing and then you assess your uh, doing based on the feedback but in devops it yeah, is just con continuous. Key. yeah it's, continuous yeah. you always see what's happening and you see how your changes uh affect oh. the running system mm. and it can be whatever it can be just there's a huge amount of nice tools collecting metrics from uh, Kubernetes clusters. You you can have a fine dashboard, you can see the throughput, you can see the errors. All those, let's say, better to have uh, better to have like too many than too few, yeah. because that is one thing that has uh, like grown really well in the last years. That how you can monitor your workload. If you think about uh, pre Kubernetes era, it wasn't this easy to like collect everything from the running environment and create a dashboard. Now it's yeah, usually, we, yeah, now it's given, yeah, it's out of the box. Yeah, because because there, I think there has been a lot of standardization about like this is uh, the expected format, and so then implement it in your application. And whatever tooling that can interpret that format can then digest the metrics and then show it in a nice graph or whatever. I think about like Prometheus metrics or stuff like that, where you can, yeah. you know, there's basically a sort of a grid standard um, that people started to adopt. And then with that, you can uh, scrape the metrics and then show them uh, in your in, the, in your nice dashboards. Uh, so speaking of that, uh, one of our customers, uh, it, it, it's uh, it's one of the biggest uh, uh, do-it-yourself shops again in France. So that's a different uh, e-commerce -e uh, partner. And those uh, ones were uh, uh, happy OpenShift, and they are I hope happy OpenShift uh, customers. So that's that's cool to see. You know that they are implementing those type of. Uh, uh, I would say new uh, e-commerce, uh, microservices-based shops, etc. And one of the, the nicest things that I have seen when I went to their um, DevOps uh, plateau, as we say, like the DevOps room, uh, where you have different types of people, like you have networking guys, you have storage guys, you have... So it's a mix of different skills but within the same team and they had their, their monitoring screens uh, uh, all over the place. And one of the nice metrics 
that they had. So they they have, I think, more than five um, five different uh, brands. Like in each brand uh, is a big brand in itself, and basically they had a dashboard like all the technical stuff, like the requests, you know, the number of errors, all of those SRE technical uh, metrics that they were displaying over their, their, their dashboards. But they had also one very interesting, uh, very interesting one, which was the total revenue per app live. Like I was seeing live how much revenue they were making each like maybe yeah. 30 seconds or whatever. And they can compare to the previous day. Like were they doing better or less? than the previous day for each application, for each like uh, e-commerce uh, brand. And, and I, I, I thought that it was like, you know, great, I would say DevOps uh, adoption yep. and mindset because they are, you know, they are tying their technical stuff to the business value, to the revenue, and they are continuously monitoring the two topics together you know they are monitoring and within the same team so it, it, it was it's of course supposed to be confidential but i was you know we have we, we had some agreements and stuff like that but basically i was in the room and i was monitoring with them how much revenue they were making alongside the technical uh, kpis that they were yeah, and, and when you have that that like key value in there then if you yeah. see a change you yeah, can you then, see a drop yeah then you yeah. see okay what happened there was a deployment okay what happened yeah. that deployment so it's exactly. very easy to see the effect of what's happening in the environment yeah and, uh, and, and, yeah and they were also implementing things like uh, you know uh, canary releases and uh, a b testing and stuff like that like um, trying new features and, and seeing the impact on, on their revenue like They yeah. release a, a new feature or change the, the website design or maybe shorten the checkout process and stuff like that. And they, they check the impact and they compare it to, to the previous version or previous day. And they can instantly know, okay, so now we, we know that we have improved whatever KPI they are monitoring or no, hey guys, you see there's, there was a huge drop of whatever, because as you said, customers can't log in or the shopping cart clears uh, itself uh, because some bug was introduced, etc. And they can instantly correlate. They can say, okay, we did a deployment there and here's the impact on, on that KPI. Yeah, so, and that, that's, that's also one thing that I learned uh, when moving from pre-sales to actual engineering that mm -hmm. when doing deployments mm -hmm. in demos and pre-sales, it's a different thing. It's you deploy, you have a rolling deployment. Yeah, yeah, everything works. But when you run hundreds of millions of requests per hour, you have hundreds of uh, replicas. Mm -hmm. When you do a deployment, then you have to do what you just said that you have to do a canary. You have to rolling, see yeah. a rolling canary so that you run, let's say 1%, 5% of the load. And then you check the metrics that did this new uh, version increase or decrease the, uh, let's, say, let's say, checkout time. And mm -hmm. then you have instant feedback. Okay, it was bad, we will roll back and try again. Uh, and then, or try to have like minimal load and try to figure out why it's, that uh, release and this is just this is the observability part that is so important that you have to know what happens when you do a release you and actually that brings to another cool topic that i love yeah I, I i i'm gonna see if we are uh, thinking about the same thing no yeah, go this ahead. is a new one this is uh my favorite chat ops Oh, <laughs> yeah, so because no, you can. That's not the yeah, same, but I have uh, no, yeah. another. I know what you're thinking about, but okay. then you cannot 
force developers to go to the metrics and follow the metrics, follow the dashboards because they have code to write. Mm -hmm. So then like what Prometheus provides out of the box uh, and a lot of companies use Slack that when you have, when you know your team's KPI, you can create an alert based on the KPI if your 25 percentile is lower than X, Y, Z and have an alert so that it's a proactive way of knowing that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it is very easy to implement and it is key for, for the productivity for the uh, DevOps team, the developers, so that they don't have to use time to follow the metrics, but they are, they are being told when something is wrong, when they can see the metrics. And this is one thing that is to implement and you should implement in your DevOps uh, environment. Yeah, in the definitely. in the first phases, definitely. like when the so, uh, when the re, uh, it can be when release is successful, when uh, uh, there is an auto scaling, uh, you can have a ton of different uh, different uh, alerts, mm -hmm. maybe too much. Then you are yeah <laughs> DDoS by Slack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then you can you can uh, set different channels for yeah. that and have yeah. alerts uh, yeah. and subscribe to. Oh, okay. So that brings us to another topic uh, that we wanted to, to talk about, which is basically, okay, yes, for sure, it's, it's good to catch stuff uh, in production. It's, it's good to know what happened. It's good to know, you know to have that feedback. But is there, uh, isn't there a, a way to, to detect these things earlier? Like, uh, yeah. uh, we, we hear a lot about the, that concept of shift left, yeah. shift left, everything. Uh, can yeah. you tell us a bit more about that? Like what's, what's, the, the, what's the, the principle of uh, shift left or, or left shift, shift left? Yeah, left shift, shift left. It's left shift. basically, <laughs> yeah, it is why it's left shift because in all the diagrams, development is always in the left side and operations in the right side. Yeah. So what it, uh, what it means is that you more move tasks that have been done by someone else than developers, you move those tasks uh, for developers. Let's mm -hmm. say that the first shift left topic was unit testing, I would say, that you actually, developers write the code, you don't ship it to the tester where testers test it, do some basic testing, and then it goes forward in the pipeline. But actually, you need to test it. You, in that, let's say, test different development. You write the test yeah. cases, so, then you write the code so, to match so the it, test it, cases. Yeah, it shifted so much that it, it comes now before the code itself. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it just so it's, yeah. code. Too far left, test. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's but that, that's a good example of shifting left that the test team responsibly went in some level to uh, coders so that the test uh, driven development. And also then we saw a tooling like Selenium or this so that you can actually do user interface testing as part of the build. You can mm -hmm. uh, like record a script that you do so that when you have a build, you actually do some basic clicking in the user interface. But now, and there's a good tooling also, JUnit, uh, so on and so forth. And also with new REST interfaces, you can actually, with Quarkus, you can run a containerized test environment just in the command yeah. line that you can test everything. And unit tests are always run when you have a code test. So it is actually not that much, it's part of development. Uh, and you don't think about it, testing anymore. But of course, some people don't like testing development because you, it's some, for some people, it's too slow. And if you do test driven development wrong, you create the code and then you write a test that always works. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the observability part is also good in here. Even that you do unit testing uh, and so on and so forth in the, in the development phase, you still have to know that how many bugs you generate because you will always have bugs even that you test all the set and get methods from your uh, entities. So mm -hmm. you have to know what to produce. And, but even more important is that what I have seen now, which is really good, that the 
next, let's say that what is currently going on is shifting uh, left security. Mm -hmm. So uh, earlier developers coded, they wrote something and then uh, the binary was deployed and the security was meant that there was a security officer uh, who worked with the operations. They created an insanely secure environment with SSL and TLS and everything. Now, like let's, uh, I brought it some Quarkus code today with uh, TLS. So now, you define in the development phase that where is the certificate? You can generate the certificate with let's encrypt. So developers can actually create the TLS certificates. Mm -hmm. So that's one example of shifting left the security, but also when you, you uh, do node or Java de development, and I use VS Code, you get an instant mm -hmm. feedback that these packages have vulnerabilities. Exactly. So this is really important. And this is like the security part done right. It is supporting the DevOps, uh, let's say DevSecOps, so that you have a security as part of your development. So shifting left security, and you have the feedback loop, continuous feedback integrated to your development environment. So you have instant feedback. So you don't have to go to uh, the pipeline and then pipeline build, and then you have security scanning and everything. And after a couple of hours, you get back that, okay, this library has a vulnerability, you need to update, yeah. then you start over. Mm -hmm. So this is really good. And now, of course, there are also tooling that uh, there's Nuke, Stackrocks, and a lot of companies are building these tools that I would say that they try to make the security part invisible for the developers. Mm -hmm. So that the code that is produced is secure by default. That, that, that is really good. And it's like done right. And I think that next might be that when uh, enterprises go to public cloud, there has been actually in the cloudcast.net, there was a good topic uh, in about cloud co public cloud costs. <clears throat> I can't remember, it was this year. But the idea is that now it would be nice if we could shift left the costs so that developer teams know that when they do the code, when they deploy something, this is how much their project is consuming money from the public cloud. So it is kind of one thing that if you have 10 replicas running and each uses eight gigs of memory, and the, every you have a <clears throat> unit price for memory in the public cloud, you know how much it costs. Yeah. So then you have a non-functional requirement saying that we need to lower the costs so that we can scale more. So it's very easy to then like, okay, maybe we should have more performance code so that we can run less memory so that you actually start seeing the full infra costs on the features. And I think that that's, that's next, next thing. But I, I yeah. like that still the shifting left, the security, DevSecOps, it's coming. It's, that's good. Uh, but yeah. I think next will be that the shifting left costs and whatever, whatever next shifting left ops. So there is only dev then, no ops. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the dev dev. That's the, yeah. the, 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 yeah. the future. Dev, 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 yeah. yeah. Dev, dev. Yeah. Dev, sec, dev. So yeah. just one, one, one thing. Yeah, we are uh, one minute close to the end, but I think we, we, can, we can spend uh, a bit more because we are you know, uh, free here. It's early. Yeah. Uh, in EMEA, they are not uh, awake yet in the other yeah. time zones uh, yeah. or especially in the US where we have other shows. So uh, yeah, so what you mentioned about uh, shift le left shifting the costs, like reducing the costs and actually just having a, a better control over the cost, like an understanding of if you run your application that much, that much time on that type of infrastructure, that's what, you, what what's it gonna cost you. So public clubs do provide these type of dashboards, but I have to admit that they are very hard to, yeah. you know, to cor correlate. You don't always understand why you, you get that very big 
bill yeah. uh, until you spend like a lot of time going into the details of that stuff. So that's one of the areas where uh, I see customers trying to you know, implement that um, automated uh, billing, uh, which is tied to, to, to consumption, which is again tied to metrics, uh, how much CPU, how much memory, how much networking, how much storage do you consume? over a period of time, how much it costs you for each unit of uh, all of all of those things to be able to define your, your costing models, models, et cetera. But yeah, I think yeah, that one, one of the, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, one, yeah, sorry, one just, thing just, is very, yeah. Yeah, I was on. just you know, getting to one point, but I believe with you know, the evolution of, uh, of containers and things like Kubernetes compared to uh, how things were done before uh, with traditional VMs, uh, it was so hard to get a VM that once you have it, you 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 grab it and you you hide it yeah. so no one knows that it's running. You keep it in your closet and then when you need it, you deploy something on it. And of course, it costs a lot of time, uh, a lot of money, because yeah. you are wasting resources. But now we are shifting more towards a on-demand uh, infrastructure uh, consumption, where, for instance, as you said. Okay, you hit your merge button, you have a feature branch development maybe, uh, where basically you, you provision automatically all the infrastructure that you need to uh, build your application, run your tests for that specific release, uh, and check that everything is good, you get your results back, and then you decommission the, the ephemeral infrastructure or containers or whatever you have provisioned. I think it's it's much easier to do it today uh, without spending too much time into automating stuff than it was uh, before. So I believe that this will yeah, definitely help reduce you know, the, the costing uh, side of, of things. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's also part of the, you know, uh, part of the DevOps is like how you can automate provisioning and deprovisioning because if you're not decommissioning yeah. your environments, it's good to automate the provisioning, but if you don't automate the decommissioning, then there's a whole uh, issue that you're not addressing, which is like the ongoing and always up costs of your uh, IT infrastructure. Yeah, and this, the costs is like, you have to think about the cost. That if, let's say that you're a startup, you start building something, you have a couple of users, you don't see costs as, they are just cloud cost. Uh, but if you don't take the costs as like KPI, when you start actually scaling and you actually, you break into the market, if you are not like, if the developers are not aware of the costs or the SRE team, it's imp it might be like impossible to uh, estimate the costs per user when you scale. Uh, and then like good example of the, uh, to have effective environment that save costs is that with a Kubernetes, with request and limits, you can easily uh, set workloads so that you have a full Kubernetes cluster. So every mm -hmm. node is 100% full. But then when you go inside under the Kubernetes, you see that you only actually, because each container is not using the amount of memory you're giving, you're actually running 20% of, uh, of the actual hardware uh, uh, yeah. utilization. And then you are wasting money, 80% uh, wasting money. This is one of the KPIs of how, how much money you spend to yeah, run to this. Yeah. yeah, how much money yeah. you spend to run this amount of money. So if I have 10 times more, customers, will the cost be 10 times more or will it be twice? So yeah. this kind of est estimation, because not many startups, let's say, can handle like from 10 users to 100 users and at the same time, costs went to 100,000 to 1 million. So yeah. it, it, you, you have to be aware from the feature. From the beginning. When fe mm. Yeah, from the beginning, how much it costs to run the stack. Yep. All right. So, Tero, we are uh, five minutes uh, 
over time, but uh, it's really interesting. So thanks a lot for being here. We have one question from uh, Jean uh, in the chat. He says, so yeah, I, I, it would be good to, to answer that from your perspective. Like, so how developers debug apps? Is it directly on production Kubernetes or open source clusters? Or do they need to reproduce it locally or in development cluster? So what's, what's your take on that? You've been a developer. How did you do yeah. it before? How do you do it today? Uh, it depends, <laughs> my favorite answer. But it has been made uh, way easier to develop locally. Personally, I don't, when I do something, I write something, I don't run on my local environment. I run it in a command line or container. I don't learn, run it in a Kubernetes environment. So it's easier to debug, debug but then you have these, uh, you have these problems that, okay, it only happens in the production. It only happens uh, with production data. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say at Game Refinery, we have a staging environment that can have a copy of production data so that we can then do testing without interrupting users. But also one, one thing that I have seen is that having a staging environment in a production, having taking only small amount of the data. Mm -hmm so that you can actually do the debugging in the production without breaking the whole production. So that, yeah, let's say one of the replicas is actually running the staging version. If you have mm -hmm. 100 yeah. replicas, you have one of those is running, but it varies. And also uh, it depends what you need to test. If you need the whole stack, you need 10 microservices, you need a uh, couple of databases, it's very hard to build the environment. So you can run everything in containers in local environment, but it's hard to maintain. So if you're developing one microservice, then you usually use your development or staging environment to map the rest of the environment from there. So you run one microservice yeah. locally. Yeah, but exactly. But some, some, some problems are Kubernetes native so that they only happen in Kubernetes. Then you have to go there in the Kubernetes environment and remote debugging if it's uh, depending on the, uh, in the tech stack that you're using Java, it is pretty well uh, working that you do remote debugging the in actual debug. container. So that's a good thing, but yeah, got to, back to my favorite, <coughs> answer, it depends. Yeah, it depends. So yeah. yeah. Again, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Daryl. Uh, so good question. And again, there's not like one simple uh, answer for that. It depends on the, the, the quick, uh, criticality of the, the bug, uh, if it's impacting data or if it's just visuals. Uh, what's, what's sure is that whatever you do, uh, you need to make sure that you can push it uh, to uh, production uh, as fast as you can and, and as securely as you can. Meaning that if you develop locally, then you make sure that you have maybe an automated pipeline that can push your fix and deliver yeah. it to production. Uh, of course, never go to your container and, uh, and, and make code changes within your production application. That's a no-go. But yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can do stuff in your pre-production environment. You can, you can check logs and stuff in production to understand what's wrong and then maybe you can make uh, some fixes in your yeah. uh, staging you know pre-prod environment to make sure that you know you have a copy of the data as uh, Carol mentioned uh, but so one, yeah, one again, thing you said that it's a key part in the devops and proper CICD is always to have rebuilt do not repair don't yeah, do ninja exactly. fix, fixes in the. Don't exactly. associate to a container yeah. or no. Don't put try tape. To fix it. Yeah. Don't put tape on your on your uh, leaking uh, pipes. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Change the pipe and and yeah <laughs> and fix it properly. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, Tero. It was very nice conversation. Thank you. I think, you know, uh, I think we're gonna have a follow up on that because it's a very broad topic. There are many things that we haven't discussed, but at least you know we have um covered uh some 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 key uh, areas of of uh, what we call devops and what we need to address 
So thanks a lot. Uh, thanks. It was nice uh, to have you and have your uh, your um, your view as an outside, uh, you know, uh, of the outside world. Uh, it's always great to to have that. Yeah, and hope uh, in the in the future I can bring uh, like more depth to concrete, like metering and metrics, uh, what we use at Bungle. Yeah, but that. That might be in the future, and there is some confidentiality stuff. But I hope that I can show something concrete that how yeah, we uh, cool. do things. That would be nice. That would be cool. All right. Thank you very much, Tero. Thanks. Thanks for everyone who has been with us uh, today. Uh, don't forget that there are uh, always great shows coming up on the Twitch channel. So you can go on uh, Red Hat, uh, uh, twitch.tv, Red Hat. Uh, OpenShift channel, uh, and uh, of course, everything will be available on replay also. So thank you very much. Wish you a great day, and uh, we'll see you again in, in two weeks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.